for that reason, I think long, long-winded answer. I think if you were selling Teddy or Turbo, I would sell Tedesco. Hey everyone, welcome back to another video from A Man Talks NRL Supercoach. We finally made it to the first bye week of the season. Round 13 is upon us. Lots of stuff to get into, so let's get straight into it. But before we do, as always, we'd really appreciate a thumbs up on the video if you do enjoy it. And please do consider subscribing to the channel if you haven't already, as I put out more videos throughout the 2021 Supercoach season. But let's get into Round 13 preview. So I just quickly will familiarise ourselves with the set of origin teams for both New South Wales and uh, for Queensland. New South Wales, you know, I kind of went through this in my round 12 uh, roundup video if you haven't seen that already. Uh, go please check that out as well if you're interested. Um, so overall there were no real surprises I think with New South Wales. Um, I guess the notable kind of exclusions in terms of round 13 playing numbers was probably like a Brian To'o uh, and a Jerome Luai um, and potentially like a uh, Liam Martin if you got on him as a bit of a mid-range um, kind of uh, option in your second row forward. But really there's no surprise I think overall with the New South Wales team in terms of uh, super coach implications. Um, with the Queensland team, there's a little bit more I think to get into. So they didn't release this um, until Monday. Um, in this uh, team list, that they uh, they had Kalen Ponga at uh, fullback, but it's been confirmed today actually that Kalen Ponga has been ruled out of Origin One. Um, and the word is that Val Holmes is likely going to be moving um, into the fullback spot, and uh, Carl Felt will be moving on to the wing um, and making his debut. What is also I think probably worthwhile to note is that uh, Reed Miney was originally named at starting number nine, um, but Harry Grant has been passed fit, and he'll be like and he's now named to start. Um, and Reed Miney is actually being named at 19th man, so he's actually available to play um, for the Eels in round 13, which is a big plus to anyone who does own Reed Miney, um, and definitely someone worth considering, I think, to trade in this week. Overall, with the Queensland team, I think there's no real surprises, I think, from them. You know, they're kind of stuck with what was successful for them last season. Um, I guess big super coach outs in terms of players, um, you know, your Cam Munsters, your Val Holmes, uh, your Kurt Capewells, your Dave Feeders, your um, Tino for Sumula Awis, you know, all the kind of usual suspects, I think. So not really too many surprises, I think, from the Queensland team. So we'll just do a really quick wrap up of the team list Tuesday highlights in terms of the ins and outs um, and how that might affect our super coach decisions for this week. So for the Dragons, Matt Dufty is a big inclusion for them. I haven't actually written his name here, but Michaeli Ravalawa is also Ravalawa, sorry, um, is also a big bonus for them um, in the wing. Um, for the Broncos, uh, Tyson Gamble and Alex Glenn have both been named to start this week, um, and that's shifted Keenan Palacio uh, to the bench, who we will discuss in a little bit. Um, for the Tigers, a big plus for anyone who owns Stefano Utikamanu is that he's been named on the bench. Um, so hopefully, you know, he'll be an additional body to have in this week for by playing numbers. Um, Joe Offen Gowie has actually been named in the Queensland team. Um, so anyone who was holding on to him for round 13, opposite feeling, you know, you've lost him, which is unfortunate for anyone who's held to this point. For the Panthers, obviously there's mass changes there with all their origin guns, um, you know, are going to be missing the round 13 week. Dylan Edwards has returned at fullback, and that's caused, caused a bit of a reshuffling in their back line. Matt Burton was named at 5'8 um, or halves? I can't remember. I think it was 5'8. Um, and Spencer Linu has been named to start at prop, which is amazing for anyone like myself who's held him up until this point in time. Hopefully he gets some extended minutes with a lot of more, uh, middle forwards um, being n named in the origin side um, out of the Panthers. Um, for the Storm, obviously their usual suspects playing Origin, but Dean Eremaya, who comes onto the wing for Josh Adokar, potential 173k cheapy to consider. Um, for the Titans, Tyron Peachy has been uh, has returned sorry, from his two-week suspension, but he's actually been named on the bench. Now, that might change on match day, but that is a bit of a blow to anyone who held on to Tyron Peachy for this uh, fortnight. Um, as a round 13 playing option, we might see a, a deduction in his minutes, and he might not provide as many points as you would have hoped for um, in the round 13 bye week. Uh, for the Knights, quite a few changes there as well. Connor Watson was named at starting 5A, although there, the talk is that um, Jake Clifford has now come to the Knights and the expectation is that him and uh, Phoenix Crossland are actually going to be playing in the halves um, and they might see Connor Watson return to the bench and again share minutes with... Um, uh, Mitch Barnett, who has been named at lock as well, although Tyson Frizzell is a big out for the Knights as well for six weeks, so we might we might see some extra minutes for Barnett and Watson hopefully, and, and they can be good value in the round thirteen playing uh, round thirteen bye week. Sorry, um, unfortunately for the Knights and anyone who was on David Clemmer, he's actually copped. I've written here a one week suspension. I think it's actually a two week suspension, um, and it would have been really frustrating for anyone who was an owner of him. You would have he hasn't been killing it. And you held him all the way just for the round 13 playing number. And then in the last like two minutes of the game, he get, does a high shot on Ben Tavoyevic um, and he gets himself suspended, which is an absolute blow uh, for anyone who's held on to that point. 
For the Eels, again, big changes here. Reed Marnie has been named to start for the Eels and is able to do so after being named at 19th man for the Maroons. So he's definitely a big plus for any round 13 playing numbers. Um, the big news, I guess, was that Blake Ferguson has been dropped, probably because of the leaky defense and all the tries they've conceded down his side. Whether or not that's completely up to, you know, that, that's all up to his, in terms of his fault, that's a dis debate for another day. But unfortunately, he's been dropped. Um, and that really is a big blow for anyone who's held him for a round 13 by playing um, number. Um, his replacement will be Hayes, Hayes Dunster, who's a 173k cheapie. But that kind of wraps up the main highlights out of Teamless Tuesday and also the origin news as well for round 13. So this video is going to look a little bit different and what I thought I would start with as well is kind of just maybe addressing the question of how many players is probably appropriate to have uh, for the round 13 bye week. Um, in general, I think it's going to be a bit of a cliche, but it's all about, I think, quality over quantity. Um, so I think you really want to be just making sure you've got the main you know, threats in terms of point scoring um, to your side if you don't own them already. Um, and if you've already got a lot of the big gun players, then you can look to maybe fill in your team with you know decent mid-range options or potentially guys that you can you know, look at as uh, potential cash cows. So I'd say overall, I think a good ball ballpark number is probably maybe around 13 to 14. Probably, you know, if you're sitting on 13 to 14, I think you're sitting okay for round 13. Um, and I think if you've got any more than that, obviously you're in a better position. But I do feel like if you do start getting to that 15, 16, you know, area, you probably might be selling yourself short for that round 17 bye week, which we should we can't really, you know, forget about that as well. Um, and just viewing the teams as well, it seems like round 17 is definitely a tougher week, I think, um, to get players for. So I guess you could make an argument that you want, you know, go hard on the round 13 bye week with maybe more value, um, you know, viable options, um, and you might be leaving yourself short for round 17. So I think this the way the best way to do it is kind of view 23 to 25 across the two bye weeks collectively um, as a good ballpark number to go for. So if you've got 13 to 14 for this week, you know you can aim for maybe 10 to 12 um, in the round 17 bye week, and then together that gives you 25 um, players, and that should be um, okay I think uh, for the bout, for the bye weeks. Um, I'll put my team up here as well, just some screenshots. Hopefully they're um, legible. Um, I've currently got 13. So for anyone who's listening on the audio. Uh, I've got Jan Braley, Connor Watson, Tavita Pangai Jr., um, Tom Flegler, which is okay, and Spencer Linu as a reserve prop. Um, in the second row forward, I've only got Isaiah Papali'i and Mitch Barnett um, uh, playing for me. I've got uh, Matt Burton at halfback. Um, I've got no 5'8", because I've got Jerome Luai and Josh Husser, who are both out this week. Um, in the centers, I've got a full set of Nico Hines, who I've got as vice-captain, Dave Nofaluma, Dane Laurie, Charlie Staines, and then also at fullback, I've got Clint Gutherson, who's my captain at the moment for this week. We will get into the vice-captain and the captaincy part of the video a little bit later as well, though. So looking at those numbers, I've got 13 players for round 13, um, and I think it's I think it's a decent 13. Like there's no real kind of dud, you know, cheapy players who I've just kind of brought in just to. Uh, this is also without any trades. I should mention. I think Spencer Linu and Tom Flegler are probably maybe the only you know guys who you wouldn't normally play in a 17 every other week. Or you could also say Charlie Stains as well. But I think I feel like I've covered myself off with the kind of main players who I think a lot of people would have. So I don't think there should be too much damage to my rank. You, you know, if I've um, not you know from maybe a few players short because I think the main guys you probably want to be looking for are like your Tavita Pangai Jr., Zay Papali'i, um, Clint Gutherson, Nico Hines. You know the guys who've got real upside. I think they're the guys you probably want to be looking to trade in this week if you don't have them already, as they're probably going to be the guys who are probably most likely to score big and therefore most likely to impact your rank if you don't own them already. So that's one way I would view in terms of how to you know judge what kind of players you should be worth bringing in and we will have a bit of a chat as well in terms of whether or not if you're comfortable already with your round 13 playing numbers whether or not you might be able to just start bringing in round 17 playing guys or if you want to um, you know just save trades altogether in terms of my team at the moment I haven't fully decided what my approach is going to be you know I've got guys where I can easily trade out like a Josh Carr and a Christian Welch for, um, definitely as well um, so there's you know I've got different options um, so I still haven't firmed up on what I'm going to do but I will get into that in a little bit later in the video as well so I'll start off with you know the discussion around potential cheapies that you can bring in um, into to who will play in round 13 um, but and also the pros and cons of maybe doing so overall my view on these cheapies I think is that there's no real standout cheapies I think for round 13 who looks like a, you know a great cash cow option Keenan Palacio is one of the most popular ones for this week because this will be his third game this round and he's got a negative 51 break even so he will make some money but I, f I feel like there's a big uh, you know big disadvantage to him is that he has been named on the bench you know we might not know how many minutes he's going to get you know he might get 20 to 30 minutes and maybe you know we'll punch out maybe like a 20 to 30 points um, so he'll make a little bit of money but just being off the bench I think in the future that's really not going to be good in terms of his prospects as a good cash cow um, and he's more likely than to be like an auto emergency um, nightmare 
you know, he'd be one of those guys who sits on your bench. You're not going to play in your 17 any other week. And he probably won't make that much money because if you, if it looks like he'll keep coming off the bench, you know, with um, Alex Glenn back on the side and Jordan Rickey, who has been named in the reserves, but he very likely could also come back into the 17. Um, and that might mean reduced minutes for Palacio or Palacio drops out altogether. I just don't see the, you know, I think with trades as well, there's a lot of trades to be using. It's, you know, if you want to bring him in um, and you want to trade him out again later in the future, I do see the merit in terms of bringing him in and that he will be around the team playing option um, and you know if you're likely downgrading from like say Josh Curran or Ryan James for example you would be making some money but I do think long term there's not too much upside I think in terms of either cash generation or point scoring from him so for that reason I don't really like him too much as a center wing or sorry as a um, uh, cheapy option for this week. Um, Dean Eremiah and Hayes Dunster, I kind of view both of them very similarly. They're 173k cheap center wings. Um, you know both got relatively low break evens except for Hayes Dunster actually he's got a 56 break even. The way that I see that, th- these guys are just going to be those guys that you just plug in for one week, really, um, you know, when all the Origin guys are out for their respective teams. They might get you some decent points in this week because their matchups are favorable, uh, but then you're never going to really play them again. So I think you should think about these guys as like potential nuffs. So nuffs is just like, you know, basement bo- uh, basement dollar guys who are in your team who are, don't play at all. Um, and you can use them for like vice captain loopholing or just, you know, as potential just downgrades. So I think that's how I would kind of categorize uh, Aramaya and Hayes Dunster. Um, you know, long term, then it might get a few starts here and there, but then again, really not going to be strong cash cow options. I think they're just going to be guys that you can plug in for this week um, to be an extra number. And I think also it's starting to get in a situation where you should really value your trades, I think, more heavily. You know, given the crackdown on suspensions, um, you know, the in, you know, there's always an ongoing risk of HIAs and stuff. So I think having those trades handy at the back end of the season, especially when they typically are more restings as well, especially from the big teams, I think, you know, really you know weigh up the value of that trade in terms of bringing in these cheaper guys I think so I think for that reason alone I think Palacio or my and Hayes done so for myself you know I'm not looking to bring in but that also is dependent on how many round 13 playing guys you've got I've got 13 I'm pretty comfortable with that number I could also go up to that but I don't have to force it if you're sitting on maybe say 9 to 10 and you need to get some extra bodies then I think it's a decent option to go for like an Aramaya or a Dunster just to get your numbers up a little bit and they don't cost any that you know they're the cheapest price in the game uh, I've got Joseph Sawali here as well, who doesn't play in round 13, but he probably will play in the round 17 bye week. He's definitely actually someone I'm looking to maybe do an early trade on this week. I don't normally do the early trades on these um, cheapy guys um, before their cash rises, just in case there's a risk of, you know, they get injured in training or they get a long injury and they're never actually going to make you any money. But I think I've got potential ideas about what I might want to do for my team. So in terms of, you know, bringing in guys for round 17, and I think I might want to be creating extra money as well for down, you know, way down the future when I want, I might want to get like a Dave Fafita back in the team or Ryan Pappenhaus and Angus Crichton who I haven't got um, for a long, long time. So definitely looking maybe if I can get in some of these guys like a Joseph Swali early into my team. Um, he will play in the round 17 bye week, so I am conscious of that as well. Um, and the thing is with the Roosters as well, I think the way that they rest players in their back line, so is a perfect guy to come in, you know, if Tedesco gets a rest, you'd expect Manu goes to fullback, therefore Suwali goes at, um, into the centres. You know, if there's any issues with their 5-8, Manu can go to 5-8, therefore Suwali jumps in at centre. I think Suwali can even play on the wing, you know, say if, I don't know, like a Tupo or Ikevalu, you know, gets a rest or something, he can easily fill in there. So I think he's got a lot more avenues to getting more game time with the Roosters, and the Roosters are a good team as well. Um, so I really think that Suwali is a better prospect in terms of a cheapy centre wing who actually has a ability to be a good cash cow and also plays in round 17, and he's got a minus 43 break even, and he had a really good game last week in terms of his point scoring so for that reason I think Suwali is probably the best kind of cheapie to go for it is odd to say given that he doesn't play in round 13 but I do view him as a good round 17 option as well so I think if you are pretty comfortable with your current situation in round 13 I think going for Suwali to you know beef up your round 17 numbers you know even this week if you haven't got any other issues in your team I think that's a decent strategy and that's actually one that I might be looking to do so this week so a very common question, I think, and a lot of dile- a big dilemma, I think, a lot of people are going to have this week is, you know, if you've got a fullback, uh, a fullback um, pairing of James Tedesco and Tom Tavojevic, both guys are going to play Origin and potentially might get some uh, get some rests during the Origin period. Do you sell one of these guys to uh, like a Clint Gutherson or another round 13 playing fullback? Because we know the fullback position is one of the higher scoring positions in Supercoach. Um, and if so, which one do you sell? So I've tried to bit of, put a bit of a map up here of the next few games and the number of days that they have to turn around after the State of Origin games coming up. So we've got in round 13, obviously, Tedesco and Tom Trevojevic both um, have a, you know, they both miss out because they're both uh, involved with the New South Wales team. 
uh, in round 14, Tedesco versus the Titans, which is three days after the State of Origin Game 1, um, and Tom Tavovich versus the Cowboys with a two-day turnaround. So both of those games are very, very favorable, um, but very, very short turnarounds for both of these guys. And so, you know, there is a risk that Tedesco and Turbo might get a rest in that matchup. In round 15, uh, Tedesco, you know, in round round 15, sorry, um, these guys won't have to back up. You know, they will get a full week of rest, so they're likely to play. Round 15, Tedesco's got the Panthers, who will also be full strength. Tom Tavovich has got the Titans. Another great game. Um, after that, in round 16, um, Tedesco will have a four-day turnaround from um, State of Origin Game 2, um, and Tom Tavovich will have a six-day turnaround against um, the Bulldogs, and Tedesco will be versing the Storm after his four-day turnaround. So clearly, you know, Tom Tavovich will have a much better fixture and has a better, um, you know, period of uh, rest uh, versus Tedesco in round 16 as well. And then in round 17, both of those guys would likely miss out because they're going to be playing Origin again, you'd expect. Then round 18... Um, in round 18, Tedesco's got a three-day turnaround um, versus the Cowboys. Um, Tom Tavovich has got a two-day turnaround versus the Dragons. So again, potential resting over there. So there's definitely that going to be this question of, you know, will these guys um, rest up and everything? Uh, so I think there's definitely a worth worthwhile discussion as to selling one of these two and which one do you sell. In terms of a replacement, if you do decide to sell, Clint Gutherson is probably the most obvious uh, selection given the draw for the Eels and the fact that he's playing in the round 13 bye week. You know, he's got the Knights, the West Tigers, and the Bulldogs in the next three games, which I think are great games. He's, you know, fairly priced as well, Gutherson. You know, trading both Teddy and Tavorovic to Gutherson will net you some cash. Obviously, not much from Tedesco, only about 13k, but, you know, almost 300k doing turbo to Gutherson. So there's definitely some big appeal to doing the sell. Now, in terms of which one of Tedesco and Turbo do you sell? I'm kind of in two minds. Looking at that draw, I think you'd be more fearful, I think, of not owning Tavojevic versus Tedesco, looking at those games in between State of Origin. Cowboys, Titans, and Bulldogs for Turbo versus Titans, Panthers, and Storm for Teddy. I think that's night and day in terms of a draw, and I think Turbo is probably the one that you're more likely to want to have. I think the turnaround period as well uh, for Turbo is better in the game that you actually probably want him for more, which is the Bulldogs. You know, he's got a six-day turnaround, and I think Turbo is much more essential to Manly than Tedesco is to the Roosters. You know, I just mentioned previously how easily the Roosters can cover for Tedesco by shifting Manu, shifting Suwali. They've got a lot of options in their, um, in their back line to move around and cover for no Tedesco. Um, and coming up against the Panthers in the Storm, I know the Roosters don't think this way, but they may potentially be like, well, this is, a, this is a tough game. We might want Teddy back, so he probably will play. But how many points is he really going to score in that period of time? We don't quite know. Versus Manly, who say, we need Turbo on the field as much as we can. Um, and so we've got these decent games. Let's just go and, you know, get these wins as we can. Although you could make the same argument that, well, these games are easy. Do we need Turbo to win? But I think Turbo is more likely to play versus, um, than Tedesco. And I think those easier games would lean me to say, if you do want to sell, I think you should sell Tedesco to Gutherson if you do, if you do want to go down the sell route. And what I will go down through now is also the um, previous history of Turbo and Tedesco in terms of backing up from Origin. And I'll look at the 2019 and the 2018 periods um, as a bit of a comparison because 2020, all the state of Origin games with the end of the season. So it doesn't really help us for our buy planning purposes. So I've got here both, you know, how Tedesco and Tavovich backed up from their previous Origin campaigns for both 2019 and for 2018. Now, in 2019, what the schedule was, I did a bit of a digging, bit of a, you know, bit of a Google searching last night. Now, in round 13, uh, they had to, both players had to back up from State of Origin. Uh, round 15 was another backup game from a sh with a short turnaround, um, and round 17 was also a backup game. And then there was also a bye week in round 12, and then also round 16. So in round 12 in 2019. We'll go through Tedesco first. So he had a buy, so he missed round 12. Um, in the short turnaround game in round 13, he did actually back up and play against the Penrith Panthers. In round 14, though, when there was no knees, in, um, sorry, there was no uh, backing up from Origin, he did get a rest against the Bulldogs, which was an easy opponent. So the Roosters probably decided, Let's, we'll just give him a rest. Um, in round 15, which also was a backup, um, he did actually play against the Melbourne Storm. One thing to note, though, was that this round 15 backup was also when they had game two on the Sunday. So there actually was quite a bit of an extended period of time for, you know, NRL players to recover from that origin game. So probably like five, six days. So that backup really just is just a shorter turnaround from a normal schedule. So it doesn't actually surprise me that Tedesco played in round 15 and it was against the Melbourne Storm. You know, so the Roosters obviously want their best 17 on the park. Now, in round 16, though, Tedesco did get a rest against the West Tigers. And then in round 17, when the uh, Roosters had to back, sorry, when Tedesco had to back up again from game three, 
he got another rest. And then from round 18 onwards, he played um, every game. So that clearly makes evidence that Tedesco gets plenty of rest from the Roosters, um, and it might not happen in the week that's directly after State of Origin. It could happen in the week after that. Now, we'll look at the uh, 2018 schedule as well. And in 2018, we had uh, round 13 they had to back up. In round 15, they had to back up against a Sunday game, similar to round, uh, similar to 2019, sorry. Um, and then they had to back up in round 18. So if you look at Tedesco in 2018, um, in round 13, he didn't back up and he got a rest against the West Tigers. He played round 14, um, which is a normal game. In round 15, he did back up against the Panthers. Um, and round 16 was a normal game, which he played against the Melbourne Storm. In 17, the Roosters had a bye week anyway, so he missed that. And then in round 18, where they, do, uh, where, um, they did have to back up from game three set of origin, Tedesco got a rest. So definitely he gets a rest at least once or twice um, during the state of origin period, sometimes up to three times as it was in 2019. So I think there's definitely you know validity to say that Tedesco will get a rest during this state of origin period. Um, now we'll look at Tom Tavoyevich. So in 2019, Tommy had a big injury layoff um, up until basically round 13. So I think he missed, um, oh no, sorry, I think he might've played the origin, uh, set of origin game one. I can't quite remember, sorry, in 2019, but he did play in round 13. Um, in round 15, he did actually back up from state of origin game two, but then he had a buy in round 16 and then he actually did get a rest in round 17. Um, but then in round 18, he did back up from his state of origin campaign. So he probably was more likely maybe to say back up versus uh, James Tedesco. Now in 2018 as well, uh, we saw Tommy Turbo, he did not back up in round 13 against the uh, North Queensland Cowboys. Um, he did back up from round the, from the round 15 Sunday game um, against the St. George Illawarra Dragons. Um, he had a buy in round 17, but then he did back up against the Storm in round 18. So I actually think Tommy Turbo is more likely to back up in Tedesco from this historical analysis. Hopefully you guys followed on. I, know, I can't believe how many times I said round 13, 15, 17, 18. <laughs> Do let me know in the comments below if that was confusing. I understand that would, would be very confusing listening to that. But basically what I'm just trying to illustrate is that I think that Turbo is more likely to back up from the Origin games compared to the Tedesco. The only kind of caveat I would say to that is that in those previous years, you know, the Roosters were fit and firing, you know, they had their full squad. Um, that's when they were going back-to-back -back premierships. So I think they had the ability to rest a lot of their gun players versus this year where, you know, they've already copped so many injuries and Tedesco is their most important player. And I think if they want to keep their foot on the pedal in terms of securing maybe a top four position, I do think Tedesco is less likely to get a rest than in previous years. But I think the fact that Turbo has shown that he potentially backs up, you know, more regularly from Origin Games than Tedesco. And if I just go back... Um, to that draw between round 14 and 16. Turbo's draw is much, much better than Tedesco. So I think for that reason, I would probably lean to holding Turbo and selling Tedesco to Gutherson. I know the money you, you, I know the money is not going to be as profitable selling Tedesco to Gutho, but I think there are going to be other guys like Nico Hines who are going to be at top dollar soon that you can cash out. You might cash out Charlie Staines who are enough like a, um, sorry, not enough. You know, you could do like a Charlie Staines or Joseph Suwali, you make a lot of money there. So I think you will, you will find ways to generate cash aside from doing like a, a Tom Turbo to Gutherson. So for that reason, I think long, long winded answer. I think if you were selling Teddy or Turbo, I would sell Tedesco. Now I'll quickly also address a similar thing with Nathan Cleary because I know Nathan Cleary is like $1.1 million um, and he's you know top top dollar and a lot of people were thinking oh should we sell to uh, sell Cleary sorry and try you know gain on the on the cash that he's made you know maybe bring in two gun players and then bring him back during the origin period. I think Cleary also is prone to get plenty of rest as well. We saw in 2019 here um, he backed up in round 13, played round 14 but then he missed the round 15 game he also had a buy in 16 and then he didn't back up in round 17 and then in round 18 he played out the rest of the season so clearly got two rests during the 2019 state of origin campaign um, and then in 2018 during the state of origin campaign um, he had a buy in round 13 anyway um, he did back up in the round 15 game uh, but then he got a rest in round 17 or 18 sorry round 17 and 18 although i'm not quite sure if that was injury affected um, i'll have i'll have to go back and check but Cleary definitely also is prone to rest and the Panthers have got a suitable replacement in Matt Burton. So I think Cleary definitely will cop some rests. So I think that is worthwhile thinking about, you know, whether if you do want to actually go down that trade Cleary route. I personally would just admit I'm not I'm not game enough to do that. I think he's by far and away the best halfback and I just want him in my team. I don't want to be burning trades, getting him in and out. But I think if you've saved plenty of trades, you might be able to make this work because he is likely to actually miss um, a few games. The only counter argument I'd say to that is that Nathan Cleary's got a um, fantastic position to go for the Dally M medal. Potentially that's a motivating factor. You know, he might have a word to his dad and say, don't rest me, I'm playing every game because I want to 
I want to win the Dally M this year as a personal achievement. So that I would consider that potentially into your thinking as well. But I think clearly there potentially is merit to selling him as well um, based on that backup history that I've shown for 2019 and 2018. But I don't think I'm game enough to do it. I think personally I would just hold Cleary um, and just ride the waves of lower scores and potentially missed games. All right, that was some long-winded explanations about potentially who to sell um, Tedesco, and oh, sorry, um, should you sell Tedesco Turbo. We haven't really talked about too many trading targets, so let's get into that. So we'll get into Sam Walker first. So I think, you know, obviously last week was a very popular trade out target. And I think a lot of the options are still relevant in terms of Matt Burton and Jerome Hughes in terms of who to bring in. So I've kind of put three different options here, Matt Burton, Jerome Hughes, and I've added a bit of a uh, point of difference in Ben Hunt. So if we're looking at the draw, I think Ben Hunt has actually got the best draw out of any of these three guys. Broncos, Bulldogs, Raiders, Warriors, and then round 17, he has a buy. Ben Hunt has been averaging 65. He's actually been very, very consistent. He's only had one score below 41 where he scored 22. But apart from that, he's been pretty decent. It's going like mid 50s, 60s. And he has shown the ability to get a big ton score, which he did earlier in the season as well. And Ben Hunt also has dual flexibility with hooker and halfback. So that definitely is very handy down the track if you're looking to flip around players when you're doing some trades. So I don't think Sam Walker to Ben Hunt is the worst trade in the world. You know, you will make a little bit of money on um, selling Sam Walker. And I think Ben Hunt has an ability to have big big scores and with that draw especially say against the Bulldogs in round 14 as a point of difference I think he could be a fantastic way to gain in rankings um, through this kind of state of origin period the only risk is that he potentially might get recalled to the Queensland team but usually they're pretty consistent in terms of their selection so I think if they haven't named him for game one barring injury or suspension I don't think he's going to get a look in so he's probably a very safe candidate during this period of time I won't touch on as much about uh, Jerome Hughes and Matt Burton as I did speak a lot about them um, last in last week's video. The way I see Jerome Hughes is that he's more of that kind of season keeper, long-term hold that you can have in your team. So I think dependent on your trade situation, if you're looking to just say nail down a second halfback, you can do a Sam Walker to Jerome Hughes and just leave him there for the rest of the season. The Storm have a very, very good draw as well. Um, probably only just a shade behind Ben Hunts, but I think you know the way that the Storm are playing, you probably argue that this draw is better for them. You know, Titans, Warriors, West Tigers, and then the Roosters up until the round 17 bye week. The only downside of Jerome Hughes is that he's very expensive, 699k, so you will have to fork up about 100k to go from Sam Walker to Jerome Hughes. Um, Jerome Hughes has got a very high break, even of 118, but I think you probably would ignore that and just look to get him in this week to capitalize on that Titans matchup. So I really like Jerome Hughes as a trade and target as well. Matt Burton is a very, very popular trade and target as well, not just even for Sam Walker, but also for Jerome Luai, who has been named in State of Origin. Um, I traded in Matt Burton last week, so I think he's a decent pickup. He's got a minus 13 break even, so he's guaranteed to go up in uh, value quite a bit this week, like maybe 50, 60K. Um, he'll be leading the team around at 5'8", um, and he's got a 64 average, and coming up against the Tigers, Sharks, you know, two great games. Roosters and Eels is a little bit tougher though, but then I guess you'd expect that in round 15, you might get Nathan, you know, you might get your full contingent of the Panthers um, and you might play in left center. So then potentially there is going to be that, you know, added cavalry around him um, and he should hopefully sustain some good point scoring. I think the way that I'd uh, weigh up these three is that uh, if you're really trying to be conservative with your trades and just lock down someone, you know, Sam Walker to Jerome Hughes, you can kind of lock him in as a season keeper. Whereas with Matt Burton and Ben Hunt, I kind of view them as guys as a bit of a stepping stone to another guy down the track. And you're kind of maybe just hoping for a bit of price rises and some decent point scoring in this point of time. So I went with Matt Burton because I also did want to try to generate some cash and I, I couldn't quite fork up the money for uh, Jerome Hughes. So I think, you know, I would probably actually would lean to go into the Ben Hunt and the Matt Burton route, although I have saved a few trades. So I feel like I'm maybe in a better position to to go for that. The reasoning behind that as well is that I kind of want to maybe try generate some money so that I can try bringing some gun players who will play in the round 17 bye week. Um, and especially around the halfback and 5-8 position, uh, I think Sean Johnson is a very, very interesting um, interesting player with the Sharks draw is very, very good from round 14. And I think if I go Matt Burton or Ben Hunt, you know, you can use him as stepping stone to him. Um, or you could go to like a Cody Walker at 5'8", who the Rabbitohs have got a fantastic draw from round 14 after they um, have their bye week this week. Um, and Cody Walker isn't playing in a state of origin, barring any suspensions or injuries. He probably isn't going to get selected. You, you would expect uh, Jerome Luai and Jack White to kind of be those 5'8s um, ranking ahead of him, at least in you know Freddie Fittler's eyes. So I think Cody Walker is a great trade and target at 5'8". So I think I would kind of you know use maybe Matt Burton and Ben Hunt as a bit of a stepping stone to those guys versus the Jerome Hughes who you can just kind of lock away as your second half back for the rest of the season.
So we'll just get into the vice captain and the captain candidates for this round. I mean, the list, the list, sorry, is not as long for this week, but I think this really shows the value in you know getting some of these high upside guys for this week and not being too left behind the pack um, if you don't have any of these guys. So Ben Hunt, I think, is a decent vice captain option against the Broncos. They've been the first, sorry, they've been the worst team um, at defending halfbacks um, so far this season. Um, and Ben Hunt is coming from an 83 point game last week. That did include a very, very late try and line break, but as for the reasons I just mentioned, I think Ben Hunt has shown that ability to get really high upside you know a bit of a grudge match coming up against his old team i think if you do look to go for ben hunt i think you really could uh, benefit from a vice captain on a ben hunt this week um similarly you've got jermaine Sarko. you know he's you know he's been pretty decent he's got the goal kicking um and then coming up against teams who you know you know aren't top teams he's got an average i think around 80 he's done very very well against the uh, against the worst teams so i think the dragons could probably definitely fit into that category um he's only got he only had 24 points last week um, but that was against the Storm, so you know, toughest one of the toughest teams in the competition. Dragons have been the seventh worst at defending fullback, uh, but I wouldn't read too much into that. I think Osaka could be a very punty vice captain option, um, but I maybe wouldn't lean away from him versus some of these other guys. I think Matt Burton is a great smoky kind of vice captain option coming up against the Tigers, um, who have been the full, uh, fourth worst team, sorry, defending 5 8. Uh, and Matt Burton's come away with a 66 last week. Um, I guess the only potential risk of Matt Burton is that we just don't quite know how the Panthers are going to perform this week, um, given that they're missing so many of their gun players. So I think it is a slight risk putting the vice captaincy on him. Um, so I don't think I'll be leaning towards uh, Matt Burton, even though I have him in my team. But I guess the fact that he's a decent vice captain option probably highlights that he's a good trade-in target as well for this week. I think the Melbourne Storm and the Parramatta Eels are probably the two teams that you look, probably would be targeting in terms of a vice captain and a captain play. So uh, Jerome Hughes, who I've just spoken about, Brandon Smith and Nico Hines, I think are the three key guys from the Melbourne Storm who are very, very good vice captain or even just a straight captain option for this week. Coming up against the Titans, who have been who are going to miss Mo to wake up, AJ Brimson, Tuna Fusumala Awi, Dave Fafita, you know, they've really just not got that much depth in the Titans team. And the Storm are red hot. I mean, the Storm could easily put on 50, 50 60 points against the Titans for, for what we know. Um, and in terms of, you know, these guys, they're the cream of the crop in terms of the Melbourne Storm for uh, super coach points you know, without Harry Grant and Cam Munster. Um, in terms of the points conceded by the Titans uh, against their respective positions, fourth to halfbacks, um, sixth to dummy halves, and 14th to fullbacks. So they've actually been very, very good at defending fullbacks, but I think I wouldn't read too much into that, to be honest, because the Storm are just in a different level to everyone else, barring the Panthers. Um, Nico Hines has been on an absolute tear, and I think Nico Hines would be my uh, choice out of a vice captain out of those three guys, but you could go for a bit of a pod on a Jerome Hughes as well. Um, from the Eels, I think the two two key guys that I would probably look to put the captaincy on would be an Isaiah Papali'i um, and a Clint Gutherson. Coming up against the Knights, again, the Knights have been the 14th um, worst team at defending fullbacks, so they've actually been very, very good at defending fullbacks. And we saw that last week against Tommy Turbo, um, who's been on an absolute tear, um, and they restricted him to 40 points. But I think Gutherson is the standout kind of round 13 playing fullback to go for. So I think Gutherson is probably a decent captaincy shout. And Isaiah Papali'i has been just, he's, got, he's shown that ability to get really high upside. I think he's got three scores over 100 and two scores in like the high 90s. Um, and sixth, uh, you know, the Knights have been the sixth worst at defending edge back rowers. Um, and Gut, um, sorry, Papali'i coming off a 62 in a well, well beaten side just shows, I guess, that he's got a very, very decent floor. So I think either of these two could be a good captaincy shout. Uh, one thing I will note as well, given that in round 13, a lot of people uh, people are going to have um, players sitting on their bench who aren't going to be scoring at all or playing as well, given that they've got a buy. Um, with the vice captain loophole, uh, you can actually use that um, f uh, to full advantage this week. Instead of sometimes where you have a bit of a punty play and you just kind of have to manage your team in a certain way to make it work, this week you basically have two free cracks at the captaincy. So I think the vice captain and captaincy choice really, really is important for this round. Um, so I think that's why I'm going to stick it on the high upside guys. I'm going to stick the vice captain on Nico Hines and I'm going to stick the captaincy on Clint Gutherson. If Hines has an, a superior, you know, an amazing game scoring 150 again, then I'll put, probably do the vice captain loop on him. Um, and there's no risk to that this week. Um, unless you somehow manage to have like 18 players and you actually have to drop one. Um, obviously, you probably, you know, run your team pretty hard for round 13. You're probably sitting in a good position for this week. But I think the majority of people are going to have less than 17. So it's a free use of the vice captain loophole. So what I've got here is just a really, really, well, it's not a quick summary. It's quite a long list of, um, you know, key players maybe to, to be going for in round 13, but then also some to be considering in round 17 um, as you're looking to maybe look at your buy planning as a whole for round 13 and 17. 
Uh, so for round 13, I think Tavita Pangai Jr. goes without saying. He's probably one of the best front row forward options to go for for this week um, in particular. So I think if you don't have Tavita Pangai Jr., he's a great ter- uh, trading target this week. Um, Jermaine Osako, maybe less so, but I think he's, if he's one of those guys, that if you've got him, you know, play him with confidence. From the Dragons, I've got Ben Honey as probably the best player to go for. You could maybe go for like a Corey Norman or maybe even a Matt Dufty actually, who's just come back from his injury. The reason I haven't really spoken about Matt Dufty that much so far though, is that he's coming off a bit of a shoulder injury. Um, and also uh, there's been some talks apparently that they don't want him as a long-term fullback. Whether that means they might, they might start to phase him out of the team altogether, that does put a bit of a question mark over Dufty. So I don't think I'd be looking to go for Dufty. And I think if you're looking for a uh, fullback for this week, uh, I think Clint Gutherson is the man to go for. Uh, speaking of the Eels, quite a few relevant options. I think Ryan Madison as well. Um, I'll, for Ryan Madison, for me, I'm a little bit torn as to whether I, I could get him in very easily in this um, so in this week. But he's got a really high break even of like 118, which we'll just get in. I think it's something like that. We'll get into that in, the, in just a little bit later in the video. Um, but his minutes have been a little bit up and down. So I'm not quite certain how much of a keeper he is at second row forward. I think the, the, the second row forward position, I see like Dave Fafida, Toe Harris, and maybe like an Angus Crichton as, as the three guys to go for. And I think with the way the, the new rules are forming Supercoach, um, you know, it really is about, I think, chasing these really high upside backline players, like your fullbacks and your center wings and your five, eight and half backs. And I think the second row forward has less upside than maybe what I had in previous years. So I think I'm not looking to stack my second row forward as much as I would before. So Ryan Madison, I'm probably um, happy to, you know, avoid for this week. I guess a similar argument with a Nathan Brown, but I think Isaiah Papali is probably the best trading target to go for from the Eels if you don't have him already. Dylan Brown, who I did own for a little bit of time in the beginning of the season, he's come back from suspension this week as well and has a great base um, stat uh, work rate for a 5'8". So he could be a decent considera- uh, consideration as well um, as a bit of a point of difference with his three nice games coming up for the Eels. Um, and Reed Marnie as well, I think could be a very decent um, uh, trade and target at hooker, given that he will play in the round 13 bye week. Um, he's very, very cheap. I think he's 476k. Uh, and so I think if you've got like a Jake Simpkin who might not play in round 13, um, I think Reed Marnie is a great upgrade. Um, or you can maybe do like a Josh Schuster or a Jerome Luai to them. Although I do think those trades do, do need a bit more, like more assessment as to whether they're a good trade or not. The way I see that is that Josh Schuster, he has got a bit of a calf injury and is expected to be coming back around 14, 15. But I think I think Schuster's a good round 17 player and the manly draw is fantastic from round 14. So if we get confirmation that Schuster's back by round 14, I probably wouldn't be trading out Schuster um, to read Manu, who has had a few low scores in the past few weeks. And I think the hooker position hasn't really shown as much upside this season as it has in previous years when you had like a Cameron Smith, for example. So I think for that reason, I don't think Reed Manu is like a, yeah, I wouldn't force him into the team if there's no real good option in your team who's willing to be traded out. I think you know, like a Connor Watson, you're not going to trade out this week. Jerome Luai, maybe, but I think Jerome Luai, he's had, had a bit of a, a rough patch, but I, I do have faith that he will bounce back anytime soon. Um, on the Knights, potential trade-in targets, I think Bradman Best is one who's shown to have good promise in the past few weeks. He hasn't been able to score a try for ages, and he's still averaging like 55 points. It's, it's pretty crazy how unbelievable his work rate is. So I think Bradman Best, if you're looking to fill in your center wing, could be a very, very good trade-in target for round 13 and uh, in the future. Um, and I've got Connor Watson, Mitch Barnett, Jaden Braley. I wouldn't be looking to trade in these guys. I probably just expect that a lot of people just have them already. I think they're happy to play this um, for this week, obviously. Um, and with this news that Tyson Frizzell is out for like six weeks, potentially you might see uh, better better days ahead for Mitch Barnett and Connor Watson. So I think for 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 now, I don't think they're immediate trade out targets as well. Uh, for the Panthers, we've got Stephen Crichton, Charlie Staines, um, James Fisher, Harris, uh, Matt Burton, and Spencer Linu. Matt Burton, and Spencer Linu. I think I kind of spoken about already. Spencer Linu starting, so he's a great player for this week. Um, Fisher Harris as well. I don't know how keen I am on going for like a Fisher Harris. I mean, maybe if you've got him already, obviously he's going to be a great play for this week, and he's probably going to see extra minutes this round. But I don't know if I'd be looking to trade him in this um, uh, this week because I think the way I see my at least in my own team. Um, I've already got 13, so I think I might be looking to trade in maybe a round 17 player instead. So I might opt to go for like a Luke Thompson or like a Corey Harrier Naira um, instead and pass over James Fisher Harris, who's been very, very good. He's got an average of about 66, where he doesn't quite have the upside, well, nor does Luke Thompson, but Corey Harrier Naira does have potentially some upside. So I might potentially pass on a Fisher Harris for this week. Um, on the Storm side of things, I've kind of spoken about the majority of them already. Um, with the Titans as well, I probably wouldn't look, be looking to bring in really anyone from the Titans. I think they're really going to suffer um, without their origin stars in the next few weeks. Um, I think obviously if you've got like a Brian Kelly, Tyron Peachy, I think you you obviously play them for this week. But I think I would be looking to maybe trade out some of those guys in, um, uh, soon after the round 14, um, when the round 14 resumes. 
Um, and the West Tigers, I think, have a lot of decent options for round 13. You've got like a Dave Nofaluma, Dan Laurie, who I own both of. Um, I think Nofaluma, though, he has he scored a few tries, but he's still only averaging around 60 in those, in those games with tries. So I don't think he's as good of a trading target um, versus someone like maybe a Bradman Best, who I think is, is a lot cheaper than Nofaluma, um, and has shown to have a better work rate. Um, and the Tigers draw in the next uh, few weeks is really, really rough. So I don't, for that reason, I don't know if I'd be looking to bring in Nofaluma, um, although I think you could do worse. You, you sorry, you, you can't do really much, that much better um, for a round 13 playing center. So I think, still, I think Nofaluma is an okay trade in target, but he's not the best. Now, I've got a list of players for round 17 as well. I'm not going to go through um, all of them team by team. I've just put some options here potentially to think about. You know, if you're looking to, you know, if you're pretty happy with your round 13 playing numbers already, just have a look at some of these guys and potentially try to figure out a plan in your team as to whether they're worthwhile to bring in or maybe how you can bring them into your team. So say, for example, that example I gave with James Fisher-Harris. Um, Fisher-Harris, you know, pretty set for round 13 playing numbers. Front row four doesn't really have that much upside so far this season. So I could easily pass on Fisher-Harris, but maybe opt for like a Luke Thompson next week to bolster my round 17 playing numbers because that week definitely is looking a little bit harder um, to plan for. Say for like a Rabbitohs, you've got Cody Walker, Alex Johnston. So maybe if you're happy with your um, setup at the moment, instead of say forcing in like a Dave Nofaluma, you could just wait a week, bring in like an Alex Johnston instead, because he will play in round 17 and the Rabbitohs draw coming up is very, very nice. So I think that's kind of why I put some of these options here. Just maybe, just kind of weigh up your trade decisions this week. If you've got decent playing numbers and you say, oh, I can get, um, like say you're already on say 14. It's like, oh, I can bring in Nofaluma this week as well. But then Nofaluma's got a pretty tough run in the next few weeks versus save the trade this week you know you've got 14 playing numbers this week which is pretty solid but then next week instead of Nofaluma bring in like an Alex Johnson to cover yourself off for round 17 um, and capitalize on his better draw so that's kind of just the way I'd you know play it with this in terms of you know weighing up your trades whether to force in a guy playing round 13 if you can maybe wait a week and bring in someone who's maybe equally as good or has got potentially better upside who will play in round 17. So we'll quickly maybe just go through the break-evens. I had quite a bit of a long time just then talking about certain players, but we'll still go through the break-evens. Um, for the Broncos, Kenan Palacio, he's got a minus 51 break-even, so he will make some cash, but I have given my thoughts on him already. I don't think he's a great trading target for this week. Tavita Panga Jr., um, he's got a break-even of 47, which is very achievable, and I think he's one of those guys that you really want to be targeting for this week if you don't own him already, as I think he's definitely someone you can view as like a season-long keeper. So it's not like you're just buying them for the round 13 playing week. You can keep them for the rest of the season, essentially. Um, with the Dragons, as I mentioned, I don't think there's too many like fantastic options. You know, maybe a Ben Hunt. Um, Michele Ravalawa could be a potential option for round 13. You know, we saw before with Ben Hunt, the draw for the Dragons is very, very good. Um, and Ravalar has got a break even of four. So this is probably going to be the cheapest time you get him for a little while. Um, and he's really going to be a point of difference as well. I think he scored like 100 and something points um, in the game before he got suspended. So he definitely has shown that ability to get a high upside. So I think Ravalawa could be a decent trade-in target as well for this week to cover round 13, but also capitalize on the Dragons' good draw in the next few weeks. Um, for the Storm, I probably won't get into too many of their players. I think Brandon Smith is still a great trade-in target. Um, although I feel like the best time to get him was last week um, when he had like a, no, a negative break even and obviously he scored like 100 plus last week as well I still think if you can make the funds work he's an okay trade in target with a break even of 1 at 585k the only uh, kind of con I have against Brandon Smith is that I don't know if he's potentially like a season long keeper because once Harry Grant comes back um, Smith might easily go back to the bench his minutes gets reduced and then he might go back to being like kind of that 55 to 60 averaging player uh, but in the next few weeks I think he's going to be a very very good play so I don't hate the trade and target of Brandon Smith on the night side of things I don't think there's too many other players to discuss apart from the ones I just mentioned previously um, I think just kind of go stick with the ones that you've got you know your Jaden Braley Mitch Barnett Connor Watson I think the best guy to bring in is probably going to be like maybe a Bradman Best because his break even is not too bad um, he's got a break even let me just find it here it's 43 so he's probably going to match that based on his average. So this is probably going to be the cheapest that you can bring him in. I mean, 430k for Bradman Best is a very, very discounted price. So just looking at that price, actually, and that break even, um, I think he's actually a, probably a better trade in target than maybe what I made it out to be just before. Uh, on the eel side, I think there's not too many more players, I think, for me to discuss. Like, you know, if you've got like like what I mentioned with Ryan Madison, he's got 112 break even at 540k, which is why I'm happy to pass on him this week. I think, you know, he's probably going to go down in cash. We can get a better assessment as well moving forward. If he goes back to playing the full 80 minutes, I think he's probably not going to be like outrageously expensive that it's going to be impossible to bring him in. Uh, so I think it's okay for me to pass on him this week. And I think if you haven't got him in already, I think it's okay to avoid him for this week, unless your know, round 13 playing numbers aren't great. He'll be a good option for this week as well.
um, on the Panther side of things, I probably won't go through too many of their players. Obviously, I guess with the Nathan Cleary sell argument, you know, 156 break even with a price tag almost at 1.1 million, although we know that he can easily score um, over 156. Uh, Jerome Luai is a very, very interesting proposition. He's got a break even of 103. 444k. Obviously, he's not going to play this week, but he is a very popular sell. I think the past few weeks have been really, really disappointing. Um, and I think, I think a lot of players especially would have brought him in uh, once Cam Munster got injured, um, and he hasn't really done that well. I've had Luai for a little bit longer than that, so he's had, you know, he's given me some decent points. But the way I see it is that the Panthers are that good of a team that I think that Luai will get his opportunities again um, to get try assists, you know, attacking stats. So I think he's definitely got that high upside. So I, I kind of, I'm kind of of the opinion that. If you've got him in your team, just kind of stick with him, and I think he'll come good. Um, on the Titans, to be honest, I'm not really interested in too many of their other and too many of their players except David Feeder. Just wait for him to go down a bit in price and pick him up nice and juicy after Origin period. Um, and from the Tigers, I think James Roberts potentially is an interesting proposition with a negative nine break even at 246k. But again, I do feel like he falls a bit into that um, into that realm of kind of maybe a guy that you're just forcing in for round 13, but maybe not an option that you're going to actually, you know, maybe he might not generate that much cash in the next few weeks with a very tough run coming up. Um, and also he might easily, easily get dropped out of the team as well. We've seen him drop in and out um, already so far this season. Uh, and Dane Laurie's got a negative two break, even 485k. I don't actually view him as like an immediate trade out um, after the round 13 bye week because he's shown that ability at fullback to be averaging around 55 to 60 points pretty comfortably, even against tough opposition. I think his floor isn't that bad. So I think he's definitely someone that you can keep um, for the rest of the season, to be honest. You don't have to play him every week, but you know, build depth in your center wing so that you just might keep him as a fifth or sixth center wing. Um, I think that's a good play with Dane Laurie. I don't think that he's a guy that you really have to force out out of your team. Um, and Adam Dewey is probably another good player to talk about from the Tigers. He's got 128 break even at 691k. For me, I think that's too expensive to go for Dewey. You know, even if you're going like a Jerome Luai to Adam Dewey to cover for round 13, you know, you're paying like over 200k uh, for that. And he's likely to go down in price this week. Um, and with these tough games coming up for the Tigers, I just don't know how much he's going to maintain his output. I guess the caveat is that the Tigers are probably versing these guys at the best possible time during the state of origin period, where you might have a lot of gun players being rested, etc. Um, and he's actually shown to be pretty decent at center wing, um, but I think I would prefer him playing at 5'8". And I think at 690k, I think it's a bit too expensive for my liking to go for Dewey. So we'll just do a quick shout out to our overall group league uh, round 12 top scorer in Daniel. He got a uh, 1,446, which is a really, really big score last week. Um, and he's got a great uh, team name. I won't read it out though. <laughs> um, and our overall group league, our top five, same, same familiar names. We've got uh, Perpetual Motion, James, um, Gabriel with five Ash, uh, James with Gimbo, Jackson Crown Hill, and Thomas with Burgers. We're all sitting in the top 350 overall ranking wise. Um, James has been hovering around the top for quite a while, 112. So he's having a cracking season. So James, keep it up. Um, hopefully you do really well for the rest of the season. Um, if anyone wants to join, I've got the group code up there. It's 286239. Just a bit of fun to get in the group league for a man talks and also a coach. All right, guys, that is the end of the video. It's a little bit different this week. I didn't probably talk about as much about trade and targets, but a bit more about the kind of the origin restings and potential, you know, how to value the trades and which kind of players you want to bring in um, and whether or not it's worth bringing in just for round 13, but also maybe potentially keeping an eye on the round 17 bye week. Hopefully you guys found some value out of that. It will be a bit of a longer video. I do apologize for that. So hopefully you're able to stick through the majority of it. Um, I'll put the time sense in anyway so that you can skip to certain parts of the video that you wish to. If you guys enjoyed it, as ever, would always really appreciate a thumbs up. I really appreciate the support you guys have shown so far for the channel, and do please consider subscribing as well if you haven't as well. Um, if you haven't as if you haven't done so already. Uh, but until then, see you guys in the next video.